Hello everyone, welcome back to the third illustration. I'm Mark Osborne and today we're going to draw some more animals. I decided to come away from the avian variety and instead go into familiar territory with our mammals, specifically the brown long-eared bat. Um, bats in general are fascinating creatures, um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, target their prey using echolocation and they are found in pretty much every part of the world except for the arctics. Um, another similarity they have with vultures. Bats in general can feed on a variety of prey. Uh, most of the time they are omnivorous, so they eat um, a variety of things, but they mainly stick to a diet of insects, and in some cases they will stick to just fruit diet. In some cases they will stick to a pure fruit diet, um, as no. Bats, like the vultures, have had a long history of human negligence and ignorance. Um, a lot of people see them as uh, the rats with wings, as people would coin that term, although I think that term gets thrown a lot, around a lot. Um, applies to pretty much any avian fowl that people consider a pest, whether that be pigeons or um, just other birds in general. Um, I've even heard people calling really big palmetto bugs <laughs> rats with wings. Though, to be honest, I'd rather have a cockroach than a giant flying rat, so um, I guess there's that. Um, these guys in particular are interesting, um, as you, as I've drawn out here, they've got, uh, you know, these huge ears, um, which allow them to not only, um, you know, cast a wider net uh, to hear uh, different kinds of insects buzzing around, other bats, but it also does help their echolocation and the fact that when they receive these signals they have these large kind of um, membrane uh, resonators that rest in front of their ears and so when that signal hits those it vibrates through their ear and allows them a better kind of more concise uh, area for them to search for and to find the specific insects that they're looking for. Um, now the brown-eared bat is found mostly through Europe, um, with the exceptions of Greece and southern Italy and southern Spain. Uh, they prefer um, a bit of a cooler climate. Uh, they tend to stay away from large bodies of water, as most of the insects that they eat tend to be more closely related to, uh, can I say this politely, uh, animal excrement. Uh, they eat things like flies and mosquitoes um, and other large carrion feeding insects. Um, these are not vampiric um, and they have a much larger cousin known as the gray long eared bat, which is a lot rarer. And in fact, they weren't even a separate species until about the 1960s. Um, right now, if you were to look these guys up on Wikipedia, find out that for the most part they are um, doing very well although there has been you know recent outbreaks of the white nose syndrome um, which they're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on with that but it is hurting all bat populations worldwide um, they're not very big uh, they measure about uh, give or take four to five centimeters um, with um, with, let's see, about double that for their wingspan. Um, for the most part, uh, you're going to just find these guys kind of roosted up in tree holes, buildings, or if you've got any kind of bat boxes around, they love those. So let's see. Okay, I'm just going to get into some detail here. Now that we've got the face and some of that wing structure going on. Um, in the last video, I, I'm i sure you can tell we had some, audit, audit, blah, blah, some audio problems, and you'll have to excuse me for that. You know, this is the first time I've ever done these type of videos, um, and I really do want them to go forward. So I'm trying a couple different techniques. Today, I hope the audio comes out clear. I'm learning a lot about the microphone and about um, things that I can achieve uh, without it sounding too producer fake. And so you know that I'm actually here, I'm actually drawing. Um, I have, uh, I have recorded, you know, this and my 
in my actual drawing separately this time. We're trying a new thing out. Uh, this is a rather long drawing, so um, you're going to see clips of this that are in real time, and then we're going to we're going to have some posts and some pre-recorded stuff that we're going to add in here um, just to keep the flow going. Make sure that these videos don't get too long, and just trying to kind of find a flow. Um, I am a quick drawer, um, but I, you know, I'm only human, so to do these full things, I don't want to keep you guys here for more than uh, a half hour. I'm going to try to keep these about 20, 22 minutes. That's kind of the deal. And as we go forward, um, we'll just have to see, you know, how much we experiment. And who knows, maybe I can get faster drawing, and or maybe I'll get uh, slower at talking, and we'll just go from there. Um, so, uh, same with the last video, I'm just working primarily in Photoshop. Um, I am using a couple different types of brushes. Uh, this one in particular I like, it's called the Ratty Inker. It's just kind of, um, it's kind of, it's just really like a nice digital inking brush. It gives me a nice clean line and then every once in a while it adds kind of a jitter effect that just kind of causes a little splash. And I like it for sketching because it almost gives me like a little bit of a looser structure so that when I do go back and refine the lines I can kind of have options. Um, I do know because this is a post recording part that these videos are going to uh, going to be part of a two-parter um, so in this first part we're gonna go through some of the uh, basic drawing, gonna do some color and a little bit of layouts later in the video um, but uh, we're going to have a second video where I'm going to go in and actually clean up this line work, uh, create actual like concise works, and get into some real shading. Today, uh, later in the video, we're just going to get into some kind of rough shading, show you guys how I kind of go through my process for digital drawing. Um, let's see. I think that wing, I think that wing was a little bit of a wrong angle. Uh, I'm gonna fix this ear really quick, and then we're gonna pivot this wing around here, make it a little bigger. So I've got some room to work with. I think I'm gonna move him over to uh, just a little bit. Okay, there we go. Draw on the second wing. Now the things about thing about bats um, when you're drawing them. You know, uh, it is actually great, uh, a great drawing technique um, to kind of and pick to kind of envision and picture. That is not a word. To kind of envision your silhouette. Um, this is a great design tool, not only for creating compositions or um, just to create general artwork, but it's a very useful tool in helping you kind of figure out your proportions. So. What I'm doing right now is just kind of visually checking what's in line here. You know, are the wings going to be the same size? And I'm thinking of that silhouette. I'm thinking what this animal is going to be going through while it's, you know, while it's flying. And so in this part, we got both wings back. We've got them kind of curved um, up and out. Um, this is kind of at the apex of that lift. And if this were an animation, it would, you know, thrust down. And so I'm mimicking the other wing, but I'm making sure that uh, it's a shallower kind of curve since this bat's kind of turned in space. And one of the cool things that I've always loved about bats is if you look at it and you compare it to other mammals, considering us humans, um, you can almost make out these little hands, especially um, the bats that have the very long... Uh, I guess what you would call them like pointers. Um, they have them at the the ape at the vertexes of their wings, um, where all the splines, sorry, where all the splines kind of come out to form the webbing for the for the bat's wings. And you can count there. And if they had just one more of those, I mean, you'd have your five fingers. So you kind of have like a tiny little baby arm, and then a little. A little like palm and then it just spreads out and it just has like webbing almost like uh, if you're 
if your mother and father were related and you were born with that nice... No, I'm just kidding. That's a terrible joke. <laughs> oh, man. Um, on that subject, though, funny story. Um... <laughs> Oh man, Mark Osborne Confessionals. My family's actually related. The sitcom next week on TLC. Um, right after my eight wives that all hate me. Um, they also have uh, the most bats in general have this also extension that comes down. I'm thinking at this angle though, it would be more shallow. So uh, we might move past that. Um, I think our bat needs a little friend that he's chasing. So we're going to go after one of my favorite um, creatures, and this is going to be the Luna Moth, um, the, also known as the Actisus Luna Moth. Um, it is a type of Saturnid, um, and if you're not familiar with that five-letter word, um, five-letter word, five-dollar word, there we go. If you're not turned with that five-dollar word, it is the largest family of moth. And they are named so because of their trait where they don't have mouths or they have very tiny mouths. Um, all of these moths have um, your average lifespan for their caterpillar stage, their two week gestation space, two week gestation. They have your two-week gestation phase in their pupa, and then when they emerge, they live for about a week because they have no way to feed themselves. Unlike butterflies, which have, you know, their um, their long tongue, which they can pull nectar from, and they can live for um, different, to, you know, different species. These type of moths and other parts of their family are are born without mouths or too small mouths to survive for more than about a week. Um, I'm drawing the female version of the Luna Moth and it's a very, it's a kind of an interesting uh, way to think about life. Um, you know, these these creatures, they, they live in a lot of different types of uh, forests and other wooded areas. Um, you can find their caterpillars pretty much around any any type of tree you can find with the exception of, of oaks and maples. Uh, they prefer um, sweet gum trees, uh, birch trees, walnuts, and elms. Uh, they've also been seen in willow and ash. Um, and uh, they're, they're just a beautiful creature. And while they're still considered a common creature, uh, finding the specific luna moth to pupa that you might find in your tree is uh, almost impossible since they only live for that week. Um, and after they come out of that pupa, they climb up. Um, as their wings uh, are not ready yet. They come out of that pupa early in the morning. They climb up to the tallest part of the tree they can get to, and they sit there in the sun. And the heat from the sunrise will actually kind of cure their wings so to speak, and it'll make them harden, and they'll be able to actually lift off and fly. And uh, their sole reason is to find their mate. So I'm drawing. Um, I'm drawing a. Technically, it's a female, um, but I am giving it the large feathery antenna of the male because I just think those are so great. So I guess we're in a little bit of a fantasy zone here. But the style of markings, the style of this extended kind of lower wing that they have here, and then just the general body proportions are all part of the female. Um, and they use these uh, markings that um, on both sides of their wings to make uh, prey, or things that would feed on them, uh, like the brown long-eared moth, or long-eared bat, um, to fool them into being larger than they are. So either sitting in a tree and pretending to be like a, a, a lizard's eyes, or um, even a bird, um, that would, they would avoid why there would be a bird or lizard high in a tree at nighttime and active, you know, is on me. But it seems to keep these guys alive because they're still around and they are not threatened at all. They're uh, very, as I said, very, very common. Um, you just probably won't find, if you find a pupa in your yard, you're not going to find the exact luna moth because chances are it's probably already dead. Um... 
the Luna Moth has a great kind of history to it too. Um, just from the name itself comes from their, their kind of luminescent uh, limish green color that they exude. Um, all species, uh, yeah, all species of this family kind of have that in common. Uh, they have these brilliant, like, dark brownish patterns on them, and they were once thought to be the souls of departed. Um, they would, since they had that kind of eerie glowiness, it's kind of envisioned that they were literally the soul leaving the body, and they would travel to the moon. And that's where they picked up the name Lunamoth. Um, so back to the drawing. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a uh, medium ground. And I'm going a little bit darker because I know that when we get into the final stages of this drawing, we're going to probably be in a dark environment. So I'm going with like, I'd say this is about a 70% dark gray with a little bit of a purple tone. And I'm just kind of pulling these highlights out of the bat, you know. Um, this is just kind of giving me a nice reference of tone for everything else in the picture. So right now, um, you know, doing the backlighting, uh, creating some mid-tones, and I put in a couple highlights already, um, and I know once I get in these mid-tones, I'm going to go probably one more shade darker just to just to build and round some of those dark edges. And then I'm going to go back to my white and I'm gonna just pick out the pin highlights that I'm gonna get. Um, I'll probably just do this really simple shading for now. And then when we get into the actual finalized like color and drawing, we'll be transforming some of this line work into uh, color instead of leaving it black. Um, and that is a great way to uh, give your piece depth um, is to kind of play with the line work and instead of having it just be solid black and it's fine if you do I mean it's all about style and technique and what you're looking for but when you colorize your line you can have these moments where you know the edge of the form kind of disappears into the background or is a hard edge against another color and it, it just creates a different effect um, I know I mentioned before that the Luna Moths were known for being this vibrant green, but I'm just using this pinkish magenta color because it is uh, so vibrant against this dark color. And I want to make sure that I'm picking out all of these tones correctly. Um, and also, just to kind of brag about the awesomeness that is Photoshop, that we have this ability nowadays that... I can create something that's vibrant pink and do all the shades and tints of this of this sketch, and then with one command, um, I can turn it green. Um, but right now, I'm just doing the same thing as I did with the bat. I'm just picking out different shades of this magenta and different tints and different kind of hues, and just playing with uh, how the light is hitting this situation. I'm imagining the lights kind of coming from. Um, just, just on a, above them, uh, kind of shining down, um, and you know, picking out these small details um, and the kind of reflected light from the moon. So it'll probably be a full moon night, maybe even a blue moon. Blue moon, you saw me standing alone. There you go. That's my that's my song for the night. Um, I think that looks pretty good. Clean up these edges. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Let's turn this a different color. Oh God. Is don't get me wrong. Um, one of these days when I have a better setup, I'll get an actual um, traditional drawing method and. I won't have these tools, and it's very different from my digital drawing method. Let's go ahead and add in this full moon that I talked about earlier, or this blue moon. Although I'm sticking with more of that green tone just to make some of the picture come together. Um, I think I'm just going to rough in 
what's going on. Uh, I don't want to get too detailed. Uh, right now I just grabbed, um, it's a new pastel brush. So if you've ever used uh, chalk or uh, pastels before, this is a brush uh, that I got from Kyle Webster. He's a wonderful um, artist and a great brush maker. I would definitely check that out. You can get his mega pack for um, for a decent price, and it's just got everything. It's got oils, it's got bristle brushes, it's got watercolors. So right now I'm using an acrylic brush. Um, and I think I'm going to switch back up to just a, let's see, there we go. This is just like an anchor brush that I like to use. Um, it just has such variety to it. And I'm definitely not, you know, anywhere near a uh, master worthy uh, use with them. But I know over time as I start to experiment with them, I'm going to create really nice pieces uh, that, you know, reflect the traditional medium that they come with. Maybe even, you know, look almost inseparable. Um, but for what we're doing right now, we're just kind of roughing in stuff. I imagine, you know, this bat's on the hunt. He's coming over this, coming over to grab this Luna Moth. This Luna Moth is very much like taking its last stand. Um, it's like, no, don't think so, not today. Uh, so I'm going to put it in some trees, and I think in the finished drawing, we're going to pull some branches out in the front here, too. Just kind of clean up some of these colors. Um, uh, make sure that these both kind of stand off each other. Um, yeah, I think, I think this looks pretty good. Just do a couple little quick things for style. Maybe add some texture to the moon here. Mm, nah, I don't think I like that very much. Yeah, there we go. We'll just kind of leave it simple. And then we'll just add maybe like a little smoky. There we go. Grab that new pastel brush and just add that. There we go. If my computer catches up anytime. Okay, okay. Oh boy, I need to close some Photoshop files if I'm going to work this big anymore. Alright, well I think that's about going to do it for us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this will be uh, episode 2 of the third illustration. Here's our final kind of sketch here. I am going to go into a secondary video for this one. We're going to um, explore some more finishing techniques and um, maybe we'll just focus more on the bat itself. Thank you for coming along with me. Uh, I hope you had a great time. And if you liked what you saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you're feeling extra generous, go ahead and hit that subscribe button right there on my face. And you can check out the previous video to this one, episode one. Or you can check out another video that I made. Um, there's a whole variety on this channel, all the way from some old Dragon Age PS4 videos to a quick draw of Amanda Ripley from Alien Isolation. And who knows, maybe we'll bring in some more video game characters soon. Um, thanks as always, this is Mark Osborne, and keep your pencil sharp.